my forties, I was doing, you know, two, two, three bottles of wine a day and, and really, you know, classically, stereotypically, boringly, you know, stereotypically doing what everybody did. You know, I was just drinking heavily the whole time and thinking it was normal and, 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 and bringing a constellation of friends around me who were, who were doing the same. And, oh, we were having a high old time and we were, you know, we were doing video and animation. It was a laugh and it was all, it was all going great until, until eventually, you know, the wheels fell off. I am the self-development coach, Johnny Lawrence, and welcome to the Self-Development Podcast. In this episode, I'll be chatting with Quint Bower. Quint is the proud founder of Shoot You, which supports companies in producing animation and video for business communications, including 14 Fortune 500 companies on their roster. Psychology has been a lifelong personal passion for Quint, and this is evident in his use of animation to advance the delivery of mental health and well-being within healthcare and educational institutions. He's had the pleasure of spending the past 40 years working in the film, television and radio industries. Shoot You have produced animation and video for over two decades, working with clients worldwide, including the BBC, JP Morgan, Mastercard and Honeywell, just to name a few. Their broadcast experience honed while working at the BBC ensures clients enjoy the highest degree of professionalism and production values. They deliver all formats, platforms and channels and have massive experience in tailoring content for social media. I've been super excited about this conversation. How are you today, Quinn? Hey, Johnny. Yeah, I'm good. Thanks. I'm great. Thanks very much for that intro. It's lovely. Yeah, Love well, it. you know, I, 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 I think anyone that listens to the podcast now knows that sometimes I butcher that. So thank you for not laughing. <laughs> <laughs> but I actually don't think that went too badly. <laughs> so yeah. So how are you today anyway? I'm good. It's Friday the 13th. I seem to be making it through unscathed thus far, but uh, oh, um, what it depends did you say on what that incisive for? questions you're going to ask me. <laughs> oh, that, that's like driving down the motorway and turning to somebody sitting next to you and saying, oh, we're doing good time, aren't we? You know that round that corner is just red lights. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're definitely throwing caution to the wind there. But I mean, um, yeah. I've been looking forward to it. I was, I was saying to you just before we started, like I was looking at your Instagram and some of the videos you put up and they're extremely powerful, mate. They really are. They really are really Thank well you. done. I just, uh, I, I said to you again, like the, the one with the, the black and white one with the, the red wine, super yeah. powerful, really yeah. resonated with that a lot. Thanks, uh, Johnny. Yeah. I mean, as I guess as this conversation goes on, we can sort of talk about animation and, and how I feel it it can be used uh, uh, towards mental health and well-being. Um, it's only recently uh, become possible to, 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 to use it, um, but I think it's really got a place uh, as any, part of any sort of multimodal intervention on, on, on uh, any of the presenting problems, really depression, trauma, addiction. Uh, self-harm eating disorders you name it I think there is a place for for animation in order to try and shed some light on the the, the causes and and hopefully uh, some insights onto some curative process as well yeah I mean come to think of it I suppose animation is sort of like the early, uh, early years sort of experience isn't it it's like we we as children even we watch animation that's how we fall in love with entertainment and characters and storytelling in some way yeah. you know you yeah say, yeah I mean yeah, if you, if you want to get into it, um, the uh, yeah, I mean, animation has been around since uh, probably about the 1930s, where you've got Steamboat Willie and Mickey Mouse, and it goes all the way up to the present day, obviously. Um, but there was a real uh, uh, inflection point around 1990s, where uh, with Jurassic Park, basically, and uh, and then Toy Story, which was the first fully animated um, uh, uh, movie, um, and uh, really from then on computers started to get faster, the software started to get better. And now it's possible, well, around 2014, it became possible for um, companies like mine to produce animation uh, for, for their clients, which coincidentally was the same time that a lot of the tech uh, became so complex, it was the only way to show it, you know, because mm -hmm. you can't actually take a, a mobile phone uh, uh, or a server and make it interesting unless you're showing what, what that mobile phone can do or what that server can do um yeah. I, I mean th that's a good point because i mean like animation is uh 
it, it, like Pixar, for example, sometimes when you're watching a Pixar film, it actually looks real. Like it's just incredible yeah. how how advanced it is. And yeah. um, you know, I think that's it. You're 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 dealing with, and you've decided to deal with some very real topics as well. So I yeah. you can see how you've got really creative with it. There's so much to it, and I and I want to get into that. But I think it'll probably be worth starting with you telling people a bit about yourself, your company, shoot you, and all the incredible stuff that you're doing. Uh, okay, so so my name's Quint Boer. I um I'm founder of uh of of Shoot You. Um, we started on my birthday, which is the 21st of June uh, 2000. Um, my history was was my father, Bruce Bower, was uh, an American actor. He he was uh, the American in Faulty Towers. He wanted a Waldorf salad, um, Sally's apples, walnuts, grapes. Uh, then uh, um, he did um, full, uh, Empire Strikes Back and Full Metal Jacket. And anyway, so I was basically I was steeped in in. Uh, in in film and, and and television in from quite an early age and basically the year 2000 i set up uh, shoot you because it became possible to produce video and animation using computers so you could use a mini dv camera you can go and shoot something the computer would ingest it you could edit it and you could provide it on vhs which is a format that is before your time johnny it's basically it's a little tape that oh really oh okay no, no i remember it vividly so, so then we we uh, continued to do that. Basically, we, what we did is we, we provided videos for um, you know field marketing. So you go to a a, a station and and uh, boys and girls are handing out little little bottles of Actimel, for example. You know, so we'd film that. And we put some metrics around it. The field marketing company would give it to the PR company, who give it to their client, and um, everybody loved it. Everybody loved video. It's innovative, right? So and then we started producing directly for the PR companies. Then we started producing directly for the clients. So. Um, we we got we got quite a good start. This just just me and and a few others, uh, and we we got an office in in just outside of Weybridge, and uh, the the two thousand and eight the financial crisis happened, and uh, we were working with Bear Stearns, which was a bank at the time that got gobbled up uh, by J P Morgan, and so we then started to work directly with J P Morgan, which was fantastic. So we produced mm -hmm. you know a lot of video for them, still do. Twenty fourteen. Animation came along, we started to produce animation. And by now the company was probably about 20 people strong. And then then really what happened was 2016, Brexit happened. We had to open an office in Amsterdam to keep working with our European clients. Um, and then we started, then we opened in New York and then we opened in Los Angeles. And then we did, you know, a hockey stick. They call it in business a hockey stick. It just went like da 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 and then suddenly wallop. And now we're sixty people strong in uh, and uh, and and uh, in New York, Los Angeles. Uh, we're opening in Munich, uh, Zurich, Singapore. Now it's just it's it's terrific. I mean, it's, and it's a real fairy story, Johnny. Yeah. It's there was no venture capital came in. It was just just you know what happened, and um, yeah. And so what's and the reason for that really is is because companies now um can see video and animation as a communication resource they the internet's there social media is there and they all want to use uh, video and animation which you know is a great tool to communicate ideas yeah it really is it really is and and the way that you guys do it as well the creativity the fact that they're all so different is just incredible it really is and you're you're using animation to get across sometimes quite complicated and complex seemingly um like psychological concepts or mental yeah. health ideas and strategies so it, it sort of begs the question really like what inspired your sort of lifelong passion in psychology well the my I had an aunt and uncle my aunt was marion woodman and uh as you can see on the bookcase behind me maybe she she uh she was a union analyst and uh she was uh one of the first uh, people to identify the sort of the mind body relationship and its relation to, to eating disorders. And, uh, and then I had an uncle uh, called Fraser, uh, who was very much, he was also a Jungian analyst, and he was into, into uh, uh, dreams. And they were a very big part of my life. So I always had that, 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 uh, that psychological background that was there. Now they were in Canada, I was over here, but it did set me on the path of looking more closely at, at, at psychological ideas, such as, you know, well, obviously Jung and Freud and Carl Rogers and, and cognitive behavioral therapy and Nietzsche and Sartre and all of these other ideas. And that's what um, I pursued personally um, and then and then formally 
um, with an MA and 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 with various certificates with you know the the UKCP and and, and BPS and everybody else. Um, and then I started a private practice. So what we have is is kind of two tracks. You got the film, television, and voiceovers, and you got the psychology as well. And that's that's how I lived my life in my twenties and thirties before she, you got started. And what, yeah. in fact, I'm back to. Well, th that's what I sort of am alluding to, really, because like it's interesting that you you got this clear passion for psychology and this clear passion for animation, and mm. they don't necessarily have to come together, but they did. And yeah. that that that's where creativity is born when when you when passions comes together, you know, and they they create that that sort of platform to to get the ideas out there. And, and you know, if you're into psychology, you can get a bit out there, can't it? Anyway, <laughs> but uh, yeah. it, you know, and animation is the perfect way to do, to sort of translate it and get it over. Um, yeah. So, what was your experience in private practice? Why did you decide to move away from that? Well, um, I got in, in i've had a private practice for about four years and by private practice i mean that, that i had my own my own setup um i worked with um charities uh, like turning point i worked um within organizations um and i worked in particular with what was called employee assistant programs which i don't know many of your listeners uh how many of them will know what that is but basically most uh companies let's say uh, uh, uh an off license will have insurance that that if that n off license gets knocked over um that the staff there will have access to shrinks um who will talk to them about their experiences and um that was that was just coming to happen back in the 90s uh, and i was one of the vanguard for it so basically if there was a uh, a, a, a major well, a, a, an incident whether that's a sort of road traffic accident or a, or an industrial accident or, or or something like that they would send in you know three or four people in order to talk to the staff of what had happened and using what was then the Mitchell seven point plan which was developed by the army um, uh, talk them down so critical incident debriefing became trauma counseling mm. yeah and, and the principles are the same roughly that that so when you're dealing with trauma, I'm going a little bit off topic. No, not at all. Go ahead. When, you, when you're dealing with trauma, what you've got is somebody who is is quote unquote normal, who's been faced with an extraordinary event. So, you know, anybody, well, God forbid that anybody listening to this should suddenly see somebody knocked down in the street. It is literally, uh, um, it is beyond words. You know, your, your mind just cannot process it. Um, so what you do is you internalize it. And somehow, in a way that we're only just starting to realize or start to understand with the work of people at Van der Kolk and neuroimaging as well, somehow that 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 thing which for which you are lost for words, for which you cannot somehow process yourself, gets stored away, but it comes out in other ways. So classically, it comes out with hallucinations, so auditory hallucinations, olfactory hallucinations, visual hallucinations, and you become wired for, for this. And the next time you, you hear a bang, you think it's a gunshot. Mm -hmm. And of course, a lot of the, the work on trauma has come around with military vets, you know, from the First World War um, up to the present day. And, and it's got into the, the diagnostic manuals as, as post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, PTSD, which, um, which, is, uh, which, is, which is how it's um, labeled today. And that's, that's what I was doing. So um, then, but then what happened to me was that, um, I saw the possibility of moving totally into a totally different area. And I saw the possibility of, of starting a production company. And I went into that. I didn't let go entirely of the private practice, as we'll see later on in this podcast, because life events suddenly kind of bit me in the ass and I came back to it. But um, the uh, but it, it meant I sort of let it go for a little bit. Then I came back to to. to uh, to uh, to in, I guess in your words really merging the two with animation and, and and psychology and psychotherapy and 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 that really is what I'm trying to pursue very very strongly today and and hope to probably for the rest of the rest of my days. Yeah, it, it, your story sort of has a real sort of meant to be element to it. It, it feels like you know you you had to have those two sort of seemingly separate experiences in one in animation the other one in psychology and then I could I can only imagine there must have been a, a light bulb moment of like wait <laughs> I can do these together this this would be this would be really good this would be really fun this would help people 
and which sort of ticks all the boxes for most people. But I mean, like, how has that passion for psychology sort of impacted you on a personal level? Well, I, and I think, I think everyone is a natural psychologist. So, so I think everybody, um, uh, it's impacted me the same way that it, that it does everyone else. I mean, mm. you know, what is the meaning and purpose of my life are, are, are concerns for me, um, you know, family questions, how do I navigate the, the dynamics of, of, of my family? Um, how do I manage day to day, you know, bills and, uh, and, and the, 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 the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune that happened to all of us? How can I live my best life? You know, what am I doing? Where am I going? Um, these are all ideas that, uh, that even, even shrinks think about, you know, and they, they, uh, it's, uh, a, a, a total, total preoccupation. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but I mean, I guess what, um, I mean, I've, I've, I've certainly, you know, come to some conclusions around it. Um, and, and we living, we are living at a time um, when there is so much more information which informs some of the ideas behind it. So we, we just lived through the decade of the brain with MRI imaging and, 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 and CAT scans and so forth. So, so, for example, with a lot of the presenting problems, we can see now the biological correlates of, 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 of what's going on you know, psychologically. Sorry, I'm not answering your question. No, no, no. Maybe, or maybe I'm avoiding it. I don't know. No, no, no. <laughs> but, I, no but that's the, what you're saying there is, is right. You know, that we have got access to so much knowledge now, but sometimes that knowledge doesn't inform. It only serves to confuse, doesn't it? And we get that misinformation yeah. and that misunderstanding because yeah. what I see a lot with, with clients, especially, is they, they have this feeling. So they feel a certain way and they don't want this feeling. They, they, they don't welcome it. They, they don't want to feel this way. But at the same time as they don't want to feel this way, they're also telling themselves they shouldn't feel this way. They're also yeah. telling themselves, actually, I don't feel this way. And yeah. they're not getting honest with themselves because they do feel this way. Yeah. <laughs> and that's yeah. what's important. And until you raise awareness of this thing that you're feeling, that you're telling yourself you shouldn't or you, you're not, yeah. it's never going to really change, is it? You're never going to evolve. I, I, I mean, I just, that's absolutely right. I mean, if we just go back to trauma for a second, one of the things that, that, that one of the wonderful things, you know, when I said that, that people who are in, in trauma are people who are normal people who are, who are, have been in an extraordinary situation. Mm. And so they have these flashbacks and they all think they are going mad. All of them. Why do I feel like this? This is not normal. I'm going insane here. And so you go in there suited and booted and you sit down and you tell them actually a flashback is completely normal mm. it's completely normal to, to have nightmares about this it's completely normal to have these sweats and these hallucinations that um that it 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 resets them and the same thing with addiction it, it the, and i'm talking clinically and, and personally uh and and it, that when when I hear other people in a room talking about how they feel about alcohol or how they feel about themselves and their feelings about alcohol, which is a kind of another layer on top of the onion, yep. then then you, it I, completely chimes with me. So you've got, you got the person feeling uncomfortable, then the person beating themselves up for feeling uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And you've got, you, it's kind of this ever receding sort of, you know, hall of mirrors that you've got that really just draw a line through that you know yeah. if you could sit down with a pen and paper you know cognitive behavioral stuff and just say look this is it and draw the line there yeah i mean I, I was talking to someone about this the other day and i was i was talking about the idea of your authentic self and your conditioned self and your conditioned okay. self is all of the cues and all of the other people's desires and preferences all sort of passed over to you and you either take them on or you don't but what can end up happening is that authentic self learns to not feel valid or not think that they should be a certain way they should be that way and quite often when you speak to somebody they strayed so far away from their own personal value system mm -hmm. um maybe it's and it's, it doesn't have to be sinister no one's trying to do it to you on purpose but maybe you're in a relationship with somebody and they have a certain value system and you inadvertently adopt it and yeah. that's okay but you have to know that's what's happening <laughs> and yeah. actually when 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 you get I don't know, two or three years down the line and you're super unhappy it might be because you're working in this job that you hate and you yeah. just won't admit it to yourself or you're in a relationship 
that you're not happy in and you can't admit it to yourself because your parents tell you, oh, you should give it a good go. Well, yeah. I'm not happy. I'm not yeah. happy. And that's what we're trying to pursue, really. We, as human beings, I feel strongly that we naturally gravitate towards things that make us feel good and we try and get away from the things that make us not feel so good, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I love I love everything that you're saying. It's uh, We clearly sing from the same hymn sheet here, I think. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but, definitely. But, the, I mean, the concept of using animation to get across mental health ideas, challenges, tools and solutions is absolutely inspired. Mm. It, it really is. And, and the way that you do it is just remarkable. So how did that how did that moment happen for you when you thought, wait, you know, I'm, I'm a psychologist. I've got this practice, but mm. I also got this passion as well for animation. What was sort of like the baby of it? You know, well, I, I spoke to a teacher. I spoke to a teacher. And um, so this was about after four years of doing animations for, for big clients, you know, for household names. And um, and there were there were good animations. And I spoke to a teacher and, and this is what happened. They had a, a, a fight in the classroom and and she was hit by the by the student. And it was it was just about just raw anger coming out of this kid. And and um, she said to me, she said, you're doing all of these animations for insert name of company here. But. But, you know, that's what we need. We need an animation to, so that kids can look at, the, at, at their anger, not, not as anger as, as, as sort of, oh, dear, you've got anger, but looking at the roots of the anger mm -hmm. and taking them back because they, they, they have got enough nous about themselves because they understand that the roots of it isn't, you know, that, that is the, that's the straw that broke the camel's back. Some kid calling another kid a, you know, whatever epithet, and 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 that kid lashing out and beating seven bells out, and then a teacher stepping in, and then the teacher being hit too. You know that. So 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 what I did was was produce the animation on anger, which the the school used and still uses to this day, where they sit down with the kid and they watch the animation and they say, um, and we provide stills from the animation as well. What what about this animation spoke to you? You know, do you feel less than? Do you feel? um that that the the you know compare and despair that the other kids are getting ahead of you are getting preferential treatment you know what is it about this situation practical things as well are you hungry i mean it's coming up today you know are you basically just so hungry and tired you know is there addiction going on in your home you know it's, i mean that'll start creeping up too so what what's going on for you that you lashed out at some kid this afternoon because he called you something or she called you something and it's and and that animation we produced for them, and and then it it won an award and it got a load of uh, a load of traction. And then um, I thought, well, hang on, this is really handy because if we've got an animation there, we can disseminate it using Instagram. So I, I set up my own personal Instagram account. I did one on 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 uh, alcohol, which was the same animator. Then on trauma. Then on depression. Then on domestic violence um, because we were sorry to put some context around this this was covid right this was this is coming off of the back of covid so of course we've got these double digit increases in every single presenting problem and the healthcare services were and are completely overwhelmed i mean good luck getting an appointment with cams right now yeah. you know um and 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 this was a way of of for, for kids to access a, an animation anonymously on their mobile phones you know to have some practical tools to deal with things to some some information to maybe call you know Samaritans Childline you know whoever, and 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 for the teachers as well to to look at their own anger last but not least I mean that mm. that that came out of it because yeah. kid, the the teachers have got a, as many you know challenges as as the kids often yeah you're you're so right I mean that stuff you say around anger it's so complex it's so yeah. complex because anger essentially is is a reaction to an emotion it's not an emotion. You know, so you've got controversial. You've got well, well, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, it is. But you know, that's the view I take anyway. I take the fact that if somebody says to me, "Oh, I'm angry," I, I I'm always angry. I am angry. They're making themselves angry for a start because they're they're telling themselves that's of what they are. But my question is always the same: What are you angry about? Oh, yeah. I and and so we we dig deeper, and they're angry about some form of resentment or neglect or. Yeah 
um, some really other difficult emotion, loneliness, whatever it is. But yeah. that's that's the emotion essentially that you were experiencing. Anger's difficult. Most of the time, you just look at someone who's angry and you kind of just got to wait for them to stop being angry or they need to find an, an angry outlet of some kind. But it sounds yeah. to me like what your what your animation did, first and foremost, gave a much search for permission to these kids to 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 communicate. But it also offered them the language to communicate because yeah, without perfect. without their animations, they don't have anything that, you know, they're not adults. They don't have decades yeah. of experiences to to draw upon to be able to sort of articulate how they feel so instead by showing in this animation and them asking in them questions you're offering yeah. a language to them aren't you a way to communicate so so the way that 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 it was expressed to me was that the kids up to up to puberty they're the authors if we take the idea of inner narrative right so up to the age of of maybe 10 11 12 they're the authors sorry they're the actors of their lives they're just acting and they're, and it's all happening to them and they're just bobbing along with it, you know. But then when puberty hits, they become the authors and they start to develop an inner narrative, right? Now, to your point, the animation gives them permission to engage in alternative ways of being. So now you've got a perception, right? Then now they're one step removed from their behavior. And if the teacher can catch that, then then you got a chance of maybe looking at another perspective and, and another way of being. I mean, it's really powerful stuff. Oh, that is. And what I can hear in that as well is it also offers them the opportunity of choice. Ah, because yeah. at, at first, it's like, this is just the way I do things. But when you go, yeah, yeah, it has been. But now I'm saying to you, what about this? What about that? You've now got a choice because you've, been, you've, you've gained an understanding of another way of doing things. Until then, it's like <laughs> I was talking to someone the other day and they were telling me about something to do with their partner not communicating. So yeah. I, I quite controversially said to them, speak to me in Chinese. <laughs> and they said, well, I can't speak Chinese. I said, no, but I want you to speak to me in Chinese. And they said, um, well, I can't. I said, so you're telling me there's nothing you could do right now to speak Chinese to me? He said, yeah. I said, well, imagine if Chinese was communication. If you don't know how to do something, you can't do it. And it doesn't matter how much I want you to, how much I ask you to, you're unable to do it. You know, mm. and I think what you're doing there is you're, first of all, giving them permission, which children, children need permission often. Um, yeah. And then you're giving them the language and then you're giving them some tools. I just yeah. think it's fantastic. I really do. Yeah. I really oh, do. Oh, good. The, the other the other thing, and since we're talking about psychology, and and they haven't worked this out yet, but but there's something about animation that's distinct from video and it's distinct from text that it just with perception it goes in and it just goes straight to the emotions. Mm. It's not cognitively processed, right? So you sit, you watch a kid watching an animation, whether it's Frozen or Toy Story or or, or one of those animations that, that, that we produce. And they, they, it goes in and then afterwards they think about it. And it's only afterwards as they start to process it. Now you've got a, you've got a, a, a client patient who, who is in flight, fright, freeze, right? Because of whatever. And they're cognitively restricted in what they can think about. They, they are just doing what they know best. They reverted to type. Those old scripts that they learned back when they were kids, well, they're right back in play now. You know, they are there. Absolutely. They may not work, but they're God, they're comfortable because I'm not going to try anything new while I feel like this. Mm. But somehow you give them an animation and you know what? It's not threatening, you know, and and if it's if it's the thing is, Johnny, right, if it if it's actors and we've done this with UNICEF, we've 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 we tried this in on, um, on a couple of animations. But if, if you use videos where there are people, you're looking at a person and you're starting cognitively to look at that person right are they are they you know how old are they are they black or white are they gay or straight and they you start looking at that person and your prejudices start coming through and you're not listening to what's going on you're somehow engaging another part of your brain and and that story is going to start to have a narrative before you've even seen what's going on but if you've got an animation right and bear in mind right it doesn't have to be a person it it could be a teacup you know, it could be a it could be a stapler. It could, we could anthropomorphize that light. I mean, Pixar does anthropomorphize, yeah. you know, angle poise lights. That's their bloody company identity. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and yeah. and so so if the if the if the angle poise light is having a problem with authority, 
well, you can't pro project anything onto the angle poised light, but the ideas are there the, the, as a metaphor, you know, you, and that's another way in. That's so powerful. You're absolutely right. It's, uh, it made me, when you were talking there, it made me think of Beauty and the Beast, Disney's Beauty uh, yeah. and the Beast, where you've got teacups and teapots and <laughs> house, household objects sort of communicating and all that sort of stuff. That's really interesting because you're right. Like those prejudices do creep in right or wrong. They're there. We we, we, mm -hmm. we got brought up a certain way and our conditioning, our programming, whatever you want to call it, is is going to take over. You know, that's why they tell people in the military, trust your training. <laughs> because <laughs> yeah. when, when, when emotions are high, trust your training because um, you're probably not going to cognitively make any very wise decisions. Yeah. But, but yeah. the other part of it as well is it sounds to me like you're taking an approach of, you know, with children, they don't do what you tell them. <laughs> they just don't. They, matter of fact, they, you can always guarantee as soon as you tell them to do so, they could do the opposite. So what, <laughs> what it sounds like you're doing is, is you're planting a seed and it's up to them to nurture it. And if you do it in a certain way, which is what you do and what animation does, it does it in this creative way with music and colours and storytelling. And mm -hmm. it's something that you feel inclined to nurture, I think. Whereas if you're just told, right, this is the way to do something. Like I remember the Highway Code when we yeah. were when we were kids and they would tell you about the highway code there was a defiance in me like that doesn't really make any sense like it's like you would get run over johnny <laughs> but there was a defiance in me because i was being told what to do you know but yeah. when yeah. when you see an animation of a story you know of somebody potentially getting knocked over or whatever it has much more of an impact just to ex extend this idea out a little bit further um one of the problems uh, with some illnesses, psychological illnesses, is the stigma that's attached to it. I mean, let's let's go to addiction. So there's a hell of a, a stigma attached to to alcoholism. So suppose you could you could, and that stigma isn't value free. That stigma is the result of of people saying, "I am not going to admit to my problem," and all those layers we were talking about before, because I'm ashamed, I'm guilty, I'm embarrassed, um, I'm I'm confirming, I'm like my father, I'm you know whatever that is. Yeah. Now, now. Using the animation, you can create a metaphor that dignifies that person's position, right? So say, you know, you could animate a Greek myth. You could animate uh, a, a, a story that, that, that can take that person on a journey. You know, do you know Joseph Campbell and, um, you know, oh, okay, so Joseph Campbell was a, was, a, was a writer. He did a thing called A Hero of a Thousand Faces and a few other things. He was a Jungian and his best mate was George Lucas. And George Lucas did Star Wars, uh, which which is the hero's journey. I mean, it's well documented sort of na uh, script narrative. There's seven stages to it, or three, depending on you. Anyway, but that journey that Luke Skywalker went on was was leaving home, uh, meeting a, a counselor, Yoda, and and coming back back home, returning to kill, wait for it, Darth Vader, the dark father, right? So there you've got a hero's journey. Now you've actually said to somebody that you're not some awful alcoholic that, that is, is it a disease or is it a choice? And let's not get caught up in reads on that one. Let's let's just take your journey as not a problem. Yours is a symptom. The alcohol is a symptom, not a problem. Mm. And what's a symptom of? It's a symptom of something that is on your shadow side, which you have to then try to work through in order for you to re return home and, and and by changing that which is what animation do by changing that uh, approach to 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 mental health you you're going to have a very different outcome but oh, when animation Sorry. You've just changed everything for me with Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I need to rewatch it. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You're really absolutely right. Yeah, that's that's amazing. I've got, I'm gonna have to make a note of that. <laughs> um, it's just it's just another route in. Yeah. You know, it's another route in because because people are frozen, right? And they're not gonna pick up text. I mean, look at this. This this half of that bookcase is about alcoholism. You know, somebody's going to come in day one. I've been sober for 12 hours. Yeah. OK, here, go and read those three books. What? I'm not reading any books. Well, let's let's discuss God. Let's go on some epistemological quest. No, mm. you just need something right now that I can hold on to and stop me picking up in the next 24 hours. Yeah. And I, and I, I can hear as well. It's that validation of your emotions. You said something earlier that made me think I, I was talking to a client the other day and they telling me they just feel sad. And I said to them, you know, what's making you feel sad? 
because I never ask why, because why always make people go internally instead of I want them to look outwards a little bit more. Um, and um, I said, what's making you feel sad? And they told me what was a sad story. And all I did was I wasn't telling them anything. I was just acknowledging, well, that's all very sad. So it sounds like feeling sad is the correct response, you know? Yeah. And, and it, it, it's like, we, we feel like we're, that that's wrong that we shouldn't feel sad when sad things happen but no we should validate our emotions it's this is yeah. sad and it's okay to be sad but it's that addiction that leans towards the avoidance of being sad you know i don't want to feel this way so i'm gonna outsource my emotions to alcohol or drugs or <laughs> or, or sex or or gambling whatever it is you know because yeah. i get this feeling that it's not feeling sad <laughs> yeah you know, you know? yeah yeah, definitely. You're 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 afraid of 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 going into that emotional state, which, which really, you know, society takes uh, an interesting view of. Mm -hmm. um, uh, when 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 sitting down and 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 uh, and staying with those emotions, and and reflecting on them and and processing on them, as, as the Americans would say, uh, you know, is is really a worthwhile exercise because if you don't do it then you know what's going to happen you're just going to be prone to, to feeling those things again and then if you don't press it you're just going to act it out it's just going to come out another way and yeah and and know. compassionately it makes sense you don't want to feel these really horrible emotions so you avoid them in principle it makes sense but you know i think wh where it gets dangerous is when we get into that rumination territory yeah. where it's like okay there's validating your emotions now you're starting to ruminate now you're <laughs> ruminating now we now we're getting to the point of you know like i was speaking to someone a little while ago who had suffered with grief yeah um i know a client was telling me about somebody that had suffered with grief she had suffered with grief and she said to me i couldn't believe it i asked this lady when her partner passed and she said 20 years ago and i was oh. like and i was like oh wow <laughs> and was, you know and her partner was a bit more recently than that and two things happened to her. One, she was like, blimey, I've got another X amount of years of this sort of thing. But then she was just like, why are you, why haven't you let go? Why haven't you moved on? You know, what are you holding on to sort of thing? And I think that's where addiction is born because there is this, this familiarity in the comfort of ruminating around things that make us feel sad, you know? Yeah. And it's like, it's a shame and it's a real trap, you know? And that's where I want to sort of come on to sort of your experience with addiction. I mean, would yeah. you be kind enough to share that with us? Sure. Um, sure. So I, um, my father was an alcoholic. Um, he, uh, <laughs> in the very broadest sense of the words, you could say he was a functioning alcoholic because he, uh, he, um, made money uh you know he did three uh tv commercials he did one for samurai cigarettes he did one for um double diamond beer and he did one for ski yoga and they were three grand each and this mm. was back in 1968 where you could buy a house for for, for 12 grand you know wow. so, so yeah <laughs> everyone just take a moment and just remember those days <laughs> yeah tissue would you like no. a tissue <laughs> you, you, you couldn't buy a brochure for that right <laughs> so it's a bit crazy so oh, wow. so he so he he managed to and then you know with empire strikes back and and, and full metal jack and if he's successful if anybody wants to imdb him you can bruce bower and and uh and so but but the house was i think there's a scots expression uh fur coat no knickers mm -hmm. you know so so we had we had the, the the house but we didn't have any money you know so my mother went out to work and uh and and we were left at home with with a guy who was let, let's put it, he's pretty volatile right let's just leave it there i i um in my 20s i was dabbling with alcohol and and in my 20s and 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 30s that that tolerance level went up or whatever happened i was i was getting more and more involved with alcohol so to the point where i eventually in my uh in my in my 40s i was doing you know two two three bottles of wine a day and and really you know classically stereotypically boringly you know stereotypically doing what everybody did you know i was just drinking heavily the whole time and thinking it was normal and 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 bringing a constellation of friends around me who were who were doing the same and Oh, we were having a high old time and we were, you know, we were doing video and animation. It was a laugh and it was all, it was all going great until 
until eventually, you know, the wheels fell off. And um, and through a series of, of of rock bottoms, none of which were 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 terrible, honestly, Johnny. I mean, I I, I didn't flip my car. I didn't, you know, I was a I was a genial drunk. I never hit anyone. I um I um I didn't lose my job because you know basically I was I was the boss. Um, nothing actually terribly happened, and there's a few incidents, but but I just thought I cannot cannot continue to live like this. You know, mm-hmm. waking up in the morning craving alcohol at you know at eight thirty in the morning. Are you kidding? What you know? But but I couldn't stop. I just I tried everything. I tried to reduce the quantities. I tried to reduce what I was drinking when I was drinking it you know, the weekends on, the weekdays off, and I just couldn't, whatever I tried, I couldn't stop it. So I bounced in and out of AA a few times. Every story they said in there, that's not me. I couldn't identify with that. You know, they flipped their car. I haven't done that straight down to old bins, you know, and then back in about three months later, no, that's not me again, until eventually I found a little group in Richmond, um, which uh, they, they, they were my tribe. And they just said, look, you know, just come and stay with us if you want and 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 hang out and those are the people that were and still are you know my my best buddies and and that's been that was eight years ago so um but a day at a time obviously i um and and the road to recovery was was the sort of the pink cloud to begin with and everything was going great and then as they say you know if you want to find out why you drank just stop drinking Mm -hmm. And, <laughs> and that started all bubble up, and uh, yeah. <laughs> so I started to deal with that, yeah. and uh, and continue to deal with that. But God, you know, it's a hell of a lot better than just running, 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 and just thinking, what is that thing that's in the back of my mind? You turn around, face it, and you can right size it and deal with it, and then surround yourself with people. You know, I do, I do believe that the opposite of addiction is connection, mm. uh, and uh, and AA has been terrific for me um the uh i i'm god light so i I, you know in terms of god i see it as an acronym i know there are bible thumping aa 12 steppers out there who'd take exception to that but i mean i think i see god as a as an acronym you know like it's a great outdoors or it's a group of drunks or it's a generally order general orderly direction and um that's that's kind of where i'm coming from yeah, I mean, AA and its connection to religion has often been a barrier, hasn't it, for some yeah. people? It, it can be a barrier because <laughs> I didn't do 12 steps myself. But, um, you know, it, well, <laughs> this is the only thing. Whether you like it or not, you you do end up doing the 12 steps, whether you <laughs> do it knowingly or not. You end up going through the whole process just naturally because that is the process in a sense. But you, you hit upon something really interesting there, and that is how you felt about your addiction because Mm. this is what people get all confused about is they 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 feel they've got uh challenges around alcohol or they're not sure about their relationship with alcohol they just have this feeling that something is wrong or something Mm. isn't right or something could be better Mm. and they they talk to their mates about it and their mates say oh no you're all right you're all Mm. right i drink way more than that i've been to doctors before and Mm. spoken to them and they're like oh i drink more than that you'll be all right but what yeah. they're not acknowledging is my issue with it. Yeah. And I, and it, that's what I loved about what you just said. Then you're like, it was, it was me. I, I've got a problem with this. I don't like, I don't want to be this person. This is not who I am or who I want to be. Yeah. And what I want to take from that is that's enough. Yeah. That is enough of a reason to go sober. Yeah. don't need anyone else's validation you don't need someone to tell you yeah you've got a problem you should do this or tell you they're proud of you or not proud of you yeah. it's about you and your relationship with addiction and, yeah. I, and I really respect you sort of saying that oh thanks um yeah I, I yeah well I, I think I think it's right there's no point doing a straw poll or some market research about do you think I'm an alcoholic do you think I'm an alcoholic because what are you going to get you know yeah. no no just 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 you know uh, I mean, by any metric, I was an alcoholic and was for some time. You know, I could I could tick off all of the little questionnaires that you see from time to time. You know, do you do this? Do you do this? Do you not do this? When do you do this? And it's like, yep, 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 yep. Every single one, you know, and I could still come up with, nah, I'm not an alcoholic, you know, crack open the the, the Pinot Grigio or whatever and, you know, or lager or whatever and, and do it. Um, but 
but you, I, it, it, eventually, look, I, mean, I just got sick and tired of being sick and tired, you know, mm. and I don't, and I tried to outrun it. I tried to outthink it, but I couldn't, I couldn't, it just got me. The tail started wagging the dog and I couldn't stop. So the only thing I could do was just on a day-to-day -day basis, just wake up and, and, and if, and if, you know, those old scripts are there, of course, they're really hardwired in, but there's now I live my life another way and it's you know god it's a hell of a lot better for it jesus yeah and I can hear all that sort of like it's, it's other people's sort of value systems that apply all that judgment and labeling of you're an alcoholic or you're a problematic drinker or you're a gray area drinker and to yeah. some extent that's helpful but to others it's kind of just you're just delaying the inevitable it's almost like does it really matter does it actually matter what you are you're not happy with this setup that you've got going on right now and yeah. that's what's important. And it's yeah. like people say to me, oh, how do you know that you need to, to change your relationship with alcohol? Well, the fact that you're asking the question is probably a good sign. Yeah. You know, yeah. most people don't, <laughs> you know. So therefore, if you're saying to me, how do you know? I'd say you probably know. <laughs> yeah. you know you're probably well, just just give it a break for a month. You know, the, the pubs will still be open when you when you decide to go back on it. Yeah. It's, it, almost, almost certainly the pubs will still be there or, or they'll still be selling Jack Daniels, uh, you know, in the local corner store. Um, you know, just give it a try and see how you get on. Yeah. Um, because um, because for, for me personally, it, I mean, it was just a, it just was a revolution in, in my life. It was an inflection point that that um, I once I got a, a couple of weeks under my belt, um i i just never looked back and i really um i i just you know i i'm so pleased being sober and, and putting uh, closing that chapter and, and and putting it behind me and but i but one of the things that have come out of it is you know what is that in the wire what was that like what was that line that um he said you know it's all in the game isn't it so I'm, now i'm on the other side of the game you know now i'm i'm dealing with alcohol but on the other side of the game and 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 my way of sort of doing service is, is just talking about my experiences and just saying, well, you know, God, if it chimes with you, then great. You know, yeah. if there's something I've said that, that, that rings a bell and makes you think in a different way about things and you know, just, you know, just give it a go. You know, it's not, you're saving yourself some money. You're saving it. You're going to probably be thinner for it. You're probably, you know, going to, there's all sorts of pluses apart from the fact that you're just going to give it a go. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. what I mean, one of my favorite things is 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 this idea of the straight and narrow. When you, you know, people can say when you go on the wagon, you're on the straight and narrow. Nah, when you're on the when you when you're sober, you've got options. It's when you're the alcoholic that you're on the straight and narrow because you know where you're going to be, you know when you're going to go to the offy, you know how you're going to feel, and so does everyone around you, right? <laughs> that's that's not freedom. That's just some sort of uh, uh, hyper controlled way of, of of living that that there's no then the only way to break that is to go sober because when you got sober you got options you got different ways you can think about things uh different places you can go you do be feel yeah. you got options. and, it, and it, it no one says it's easy and i love what you said there about if you want to know uh why you drink stop drinking because that was said to me and that was oh, really a, that, that was a turning point to me my my uh my mentor Malachi Dunn, he he said that to me. He said a lot of things to me, like them sort of little sayings like that. And it's true. It's so true because to me, there's like there's there's two initial steps. There's obviously the abstinence of alcohol, but yeah. then all of a sudden it's like, oh, I can't outsource my emotions. What is this feeling I'm having? I, <laughs> I, I just wanted to, you know, my dog never got warped so much. <laughs> when I, when the first two weeks when I, when I wasn't drinking, because I was just like, I don't know what to do with this feeling I have. And that's when I realized that I don't have cravings. This inanimate object, this bottle of liquid doesn't have control over me. I offer it control. Um, yeah. So yeah. it's like, what am I, what am I doing here? What's actually happening? Oh, I'm experiencing emotions. And yeah. it's not a it's not a um, a craving. It's a it's a reaction. Drinking is a reaction. It's it's not a craving because this bottle does not have that control. It cannot. It's yeah. a bottle of liquid. It's it, yeah. why does this bottle of liquid have so much control over me more than a Seven Up or you yeah. know whatever? And obviously, I know it's more complex than that. But um, yeah, I, I, it's interesting that because I'd never heard anyone else say that, and now you said that. It's interesting. But I also wanted to get your perspective on. 
I think sometimes when it comes to addiction, and I'm talking about addiction as as whatever it is, you know, um, yeah. people get very focused on the thing that they're addicted to. Yeah. So if someone's addicted to food, they think, oh, okay, um, I'm overweight, potentially, I'm going to go to a slimming club, and the slimming club encourages them to focus solely on food. Mm -hmm. here we go focus on food but that doesn't really solve the problem because it's not necessarily the food it's it, it that is it's the addiction that's yeah. just the weapon that addiction uses in order to get you addicted and for us it was alcohol for some people it's drugs i always think it's a shame that you have alcoholics anonymous uh, narcotics anonymous overeating anonymous should it just be called addictions anonymous because it's it's the same principles isn't it um yeah. so I, you know, I, I wonder what your thoughts are on addiction as a whole it, uh, as, uh, against the idea that, oh, you're addicted to alcohol. You need to focus on that. You're addicted to food, sex, whatever it is, porn. Um, and, and then you focus on those things instead of the actual addiction. Well, yeah. I mean, if we talk about sugar donuts, um, imagine imagine if you never had a sugar donut and uh, and then you go and somebody gives you a sugar donut and you taste that sugar donut and mind blowing, right? This is an amazing texture, the sh icing sugars there, the, 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 the crunchiness of it or the texture of the dough. That's just fantastic. And, and then you go away having finished the donut and you think, Oh, I, you know what? I really fancy another one of those donuts. And that's the arousal curve starts. Then mm. it's the anticipation of the donut. And, and neurochemically, there's, and this is where there's some really interesting research, neurochemically what happens is just thinking about it starts the little, that starts the band playing, right? Mm. So the dopamine's going in there, the endorphins are going in there, and, and you're starting to think about it. Okay, now you're thinking about the donut. Now you want to go and get the donut. Okay, because you're anticipating what's going to happen. You haven't had the donut yet. It's an inert bloody object, like your bottle of liquor, you know, like your liquid. It's a donut, for Christ's sake. You're putting all of that stuff onto the donut, but you're still going to go for it. And then you have the donut. And guess what? It may be great. It may not. The chances are it's not going to be as good as you thought it was going to be. It's the anticipation of it. And that's why, uh, in terms of addiction, it, that it, it's the um it's the uh what's the exact expression uh the the um uh, the iterative good feeling it's not a consistent every single time it's that sometimes it's good sometimes it's great sometimes it's not great but you're constantly drawn back to it and that's why you know gambling for example one arm bandits or 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 even you know instagram for that matter you know you go back to it and and you want that hit sometimes it's the wanting of the hit and then the hit. So if mm. you look at addiction, I mean, if I look, if looking at addiction, if you go back, regardless of the substance, whether it's roulette or Jack Daniels or or donuts, it's the anticipation of it starts the thing going, and then, and then there's a consummation of it, mm. you know, it, and it's that's that's how I think of it. That, and that's um, well, that's where I'm at today on it, thinking about it anyway. And yeah. neurochemically, it seems to be if you if you put somebody in an MRI scanner and you flash up Jack Daniels on the inside of their goggles, boom, there's the light, you know, Interesting. And, it's, and 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 the thing is, Johnny, that because we have blind sight, so the eyes work at 30 uh, megahertz a second or whatever it is. And, and and but we have blind sight. So we see things before we actually see it. So so that light will flash up before you're consciously aware of it. You know, wow. so yeah, so so your so your your ability. That's why you know I think it's so important to to stay in dry places or, or to or to watch. You know, hungry, angry, lonely, tired, because then your your guards down and and you that 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 anticipatory response can happen and and you're not cognitively aware of it, but you're still thinking, oh, hang on, something's not quite right. Oh, hang on, I get it now. It's it's this. So I was rambling a bit. There. No, that... no, 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 no. Some, some of my hardest days were literally solved by me going to bed. Yeah. At, at like half seven, eight o'clock because yeah. I was struggling. I was struggling and it was just that I was tired. And you're so right. And I don't think people speak about this enough. Those basic needs. It's like the person that holds in a wee. Like <laughs> I have a client <laughs> and they're sat like this and I'm like, do you need to go for a wee? And it's like, yeah yeah do you mind i'm like 
why didn't you just go? They're like, oh, you know, I, I didn't want to. Uh, rah, rah, rah. And I think to myself, right, okay, that's a fundamental need that you have. If you're neglecting the need to go for a wee, what else are you neglecting on a bigger scale than that? You know, because yeah, it, yeah. it, it gets really interesting at that point for me. So for me, it's like, if you need to go to the toilet, if you're hungry, if you're tired, if, um, uh, you know, you've had a collection of stressy things happen in your day and that could just be, you know, you hit every red light on the school run. <laughs> could be anything. Yeah. It doesn't have to be anything horrendous. Like that's, that's enough really, I think. <laughs> yeah. It's enough yeah. to cause someone to drink. And it's like my, the guy that I worked with, he said to me that it most likely won't be the bad things that catch you out. It will be the good things when it comes okay. to alcohol. It will be the person that turns up who's just passed their driving test and they turn up with a bottle of champagne and it, they'll mm -hmm. catch you out. That's mm -hmm. where you'll have that real feeling of, oh, maybe I could just have one. Because yeah. there's almost a bit of prep when something bad happens. It's sort of, sort of <laughs> you know you can't turn to this because it, it's a bad it's a bad time. But oh, it doesn't seem so bad. Look, it's a happy occasion. I can have a yeah. glass of wine or I can have a glass yeah. of champagne. What then, though? Yeah. Because <laughs> that's when yeah. you've just woken up the addiction monster and he says, oh, I thought we weren't friends anymore. But it seems like... Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like we're back in the game again. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're anthropomorphizing the booze, right? Yeah. yeah. You're almost anthropomorphizing your own mind, though. It's great. There's a there's a song by um, Johnny Cash called The Beast in Me. I don't know if you ever heard it. And one of the lines is, sometimes it tries to fool me that it's just a teddy bear and even tries to fool me that it isn't even there. And that is when I must be aware of the beast in me. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. And that's giving me goosebumps. <laughs> that is that's mega. That's a that's a really good little bit of a of a line that. Um was, just a, was there any, yeah, go on. Just on the last question really, like just as we close down, I've really enjoyed this conversation. We've we've gone all <laughs> over the place with it. And I love I love those type of conversations. <laughs> Um, but is there anything that you'd like to pass on to the people listening that you feel could help them with their self-development? Just, uh, um, I get asked this, I, I, just the basics, mind, body, spirit. So body is, is, you know, sleep hygiene, as you sort of talked about there, hydration, exercise, diet, just, just, just somehow, you know, get, get an equilibrium with that. And then in terms of, uh, mind, you've got the psychology of, of what you're doing. So, you know, if you can meditate, think about your thinkings, try and gain some perspective, put aside some time to, to really think about how you're working cognitively um, and read. Um, and then spirit is, is I think, I think everybody, I don't know how you feel about this, but I think everybody has a, a relationship to something larger than themselves, whether that's the great outdoors or, um, someone said to me the other day that um, uh, they were they were trying to explain God, and they said that you know you can pick up a book and you can read it. Now you don't understand you 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 have an insight into the mind of the author through reading the book. Mm. So maybe you have an insight into something bigger by by living. Um, Tony Bennett, when when Amy Winehouse died, Tony Bennett said, "Life teaches you how to live as long as you live long enough to learn." Wow. Right? <laughs> wow whoa <laughs> good one that is um, a good one uh so you know as we go through life you know you i mean clearly you know you're you're very very self-aware and 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 you're you know you you learn you pick up these things as you go on and then you can mm. you can design your life and and you can see where uh, but it's it's everybody's personal journey it's everybody's personal process and i think we're too caught up on people dealing with uh you know with rote with authority with tradition um or or by put down by 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 uh the, by society uh or by parents you know i mean you know the the top 10 uh um wishes of the dying um uh, there's a there's a book called the top 10 wishes of the dying which was written by a palliative nurse Mm. And number one or number two up there was, I wish I'd lived my own life. Mm. I wish I'd lived my own life. And, yeah. Ouch. <laughs> yeah. Blimey. Uh, that, that, that's a, uh, wow. Yeah. I mean, I get that feeling. Uh, I, I, I would never have classified myself as a spiritual person um, mm -hmm. until I went sober and then spirituality just kept popping up everywhere for me. And where I found it the most 
the the place that gives me a feeling that I don't get anywhere else that's, that I don't know how to articulate is is any form of mountains. Oh yeah. Yeah, whenever I go to Snowdon or Scotland or um anywhere like that, just you hear kids especially say awesome, awesome. And it's like when you really think about it, like you're in awe of something. I just it literally makes me speechless when I see mountains. Yeah. I don't know what I can't believe what I'm seeing. It just it creates a feeling in me that I can't get anywhere else, not even from alcohol. You know, so I know that if I'm struggling a little bit, it's time to plan a mountain trip, you know, and, and do some mountain stuff. Well, isn't that something? So so you see, you have a sense of the miraculous in your everyday life. Mm. And you can connect with that. Yeah, and I think that that is fundamental to to it because I mean, is it fair to say, Johnny? I mean, phrase it as a question: that the, the more people get involved with addiction, the, the the less open to there being something outside of their particular relationship to something. It becomes very, very confined, claustrophobic. Yeah. They can't see beyond that dynamic. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And it... go ahead, sorry. No, no, go on. With you in the mountains is. Yeah, but I mean, it's like people describe alcohol as as like the devil's juice and stuff, and it's like you can see why because it does it stops you from like I I didn't care. I've been on I went on mountaineering trips before, and in Scotland I went because it ended with a pub that was filled with whiskey. <laughs> so I literally endured five Monroe Mountains just to drink whiskey at the end, and mm -hmm. I look back now and I don't remember doing it. And it's like, that's ridiculous. You know, <laughs> that's yeah. ridiculous. Like, uh, I'm going to stop short of being unkind to myself. But now I'm doing the mountains, you know, and there's so much, there's so many metaphors you know, with the with the mountains, climbing up the mountains, doing hard things, enjoying the journey, getting to the top, summiting, all them different things. And yeah. I, I just love it. I love it. I remember I got to take my wife and kids to Snowden a few years ago. And I, I always um, like to, 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 to lead on the mountain. I like to have the map and the compass and all that. But I lead from behind because I like to see everybody. So I was just watching my family, just experiencing the mountains in different ways and going through these different experiences. One minute, someone's really struggling and it's really hard, like steep climb. Next minute, yeah. they're, they're in awe of a lake or some snow next minute they're laughing at a sheep going for a poo or something you know and it's just all of these little life happening moments you know that that you didn't expect and when you see it you're just like this is amazing and you just really you, you learn this real appreciation i think so yeah yeah yes i, I think you're, you're very lucky to have that that's a wonderful that's a wonderful thing to have isn't it yeah i don't do it enough i'm, I'm realizing that in this moment i don't do it enough definitely <laughs> But another thing that you said was was great was like almost like that you're gesturing towards the idea of making appointment with yourself. Mm. You know, our diaries are full all the time with all these people we've got to see, whether it's virtually or in person. But when mm. do we actually make an appointment with ourselves? And, you know, you alluded to potentially meditation or just some reflective yeah. thinking. But yeah. the whole idea is just spending a time, a moment to check in with yourself and just yeah. ask yourself, how you doing? You know, yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah, 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 and and to sit down with a piece with a pencil and a piece of paper and just you know just draw out some of the ways that you're thinking about things, to to try and you know use another part of your brain to 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 examine maybe there's other ways of looking at things. Mm. What are the alternatives? And and um, and they come up. They do come up. There's you know as Einstein said you know you either treat life as if it's just uh, not a miracle or you treat it like every second's a miracle. There's enough going on just inside our bodies right now that we have no control of whatsoever. And and you know it, the the even even that sort of the, the 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 fact that you know I don't even know if I am a body or if I have a body. You know let's yeah. get into the linguistics around it. You know and we're we're sitting on this blue marble in the middle of the the arse end of some galaxy that you know is you look at the james webb stuff that's coming through at the moment i mean it's just mm. mind-blowing and to live at this time there's enough miracles out there to sit there and go jesus what you know yeah. just, it's just stunning yeah and we've only got 10 minutes left to live haven't we so you know well, well, let's just appreciate it <laughs> yeah and i mean i mean like you're right like when you speak to people at the back end of their life the advice they give you is not have a six-pack <laughs> yeah. it's often like spend more time with this person or make sure you do this or 
never yeah. leave the house without giving your partner embracing your partner in some way whatever but it's yeah. often the things that we think we've got always got time for but yeah we, we don't we don't realize yeah. that you know it's well, and this this is one of the things that i i see with with our employees i mean the, i think the average age in the company is something like 25 or something and and i see them all the time whatsapping you know texting uh dming one another and what they're not doing is picking up the phone and having a conversation you know yeah. have a conversation yeah. we're yeah. living in this sort of hyper connected hyper personalized this is what our clients say well, give me another video over this viral that does hyper personalized connectivity oh yeah sure okay fine but but you know pick up the goddamn telephone and call someone how are you feeling today they're just checking in you know mm -hmm. and 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 have that conversation and and see what comes up because yeah. Honestly, we're becoming so. The irony of it is, we 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 have you know ten thousand friends on on Instagram, uh, and yeah, and no no one you know to really talk to and say actually you know what I'm feeling pretty down today. This yeah. happened. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, happened? it's the illusion of that we're we we've never been so connected, but we're actually very disconnected. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because we're not yeah. actually. We, we, we're talking surface level stuff you know commenting yeah. on somebody's post or um you know oh what a lovely picture and uh, you know it, it can go deep really couldn't it it really could yeah but we we must bring it to the end i've really loved this conversation thank you so yeah, much John, me too. um just just one last thing what's next for you and where can people find you social media anything you want to bring their attention to before we wrap up well, uh, obviously, the, the website is shootyou.com, which is where um, a lot of our best work is from a professional point of view. From a personal point of view, I'm I'm dialing up what I'm doing with, with the animations and, and mental health. So uh, my IG account is at Quint Boa. Um, so, so have a look there and, and please have a look at any of the animations and give me some feedback so I can make them better. Um, what I want to do is is do more of these animations, get them out there, get them out there in schools, get them out there in in within the NHS, get them into in with employers, and 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 to really raise the level. Oh, I've got a book out. <laughs> to, this is not a book promotion. This is six not quid on Amazon, and uh, and you know, obviously, I'm not making any money off the back of it, but it's an interesting idea, uh, which is basically it's that the power of animation is application to mental health and well-being which goes more into depth about you know what we've been talking about in this podcast yeah. um and and I, I really think that animation has got a, a place in 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 in, in education in, in nhs in in with employers employer relations all of it and that's really what i want to push johnny honestly that's all i want to do from from here on in uh and uh because because i love it i love animation love psychology love philosophy and i even love talking to you on these <laughs> wonderful subjects <laughs> oh so did I. Uh, I i've definitely got my uh i have this theory around philosophical loneliness um is when you can be in a room full of people and still feel lonely because they want to talk about love island and you want to talk about um, ideas now yeah. there's nothing wrong with love island i've just it's just not my bag but I've definitely got my philosophical loneliness fixed today for sure. <laughs> you know, so me thank too. you very much for that. And uh, great, it would be terrible of me not to mention I can see Sober Dave's book in the background. So, <laughs> yeah, he'll like that. <laughs> yeah, he will. There he is, Sober Dave. Yeah. Um, I love it. Yeah. Right, listen, Quint, thank you so much. Um, I really valued this and I look forward to the idea of doing it again someday. Yeah, brilliant. Yes. Thanks ever so much, John. It's been great talking to you. Thanks.